Hi everybody, we're back with part three of our interview with Mr. Hugh Padgham. Many of you have been requesting that we talk about the police albums that Hugh made. And we're going to do just that and many other wonderful things. So please check out part three of our three-part series with Mr. Hugh Padgham. But Split Ends, again, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, what a, you know, N Neil is, I think, one of my favourite songwriters. He's right up there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I really, really rated Split Ends. Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of put them in the same, I mean, not musically, but I put them in my top tier of, bands I loved working with. I mean, I, put, I, I, I kind of equate them to XTC in a way, in the sense that they never became massive, massive, but were uh, incredible. I first met them when I was studio engineer at Virgin, and I did an album with them at the Manor. And it was after their whatever album it was that made them quite well known. This album was produced and engineered God knows where they got this guy from, but I still remember his name. He was an American guy called Mallory Earl. And the, 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 the record is, I would say, I was basically there to oversee what he was doing. I couldn't tell what, I was kind of engineer, but I was really assistant. Anyway, it's probably the worst sounding album that's ever, ever been recorded. I don't know how it could have been so bad. So anyway, I got friendly with the band from, from that, and then they asked me to do their next record, which I then went to Australia for the first time and did that record, which was called Conflicting Emotions, I think. And it had Six Months in a Leaky Boat on it, which happened to come out um, the week that England went to war with Argentina over the Falklands. And so our Navy had set off from Southampton or whatever to sail to the Falklands which was going to take two months or something. So releasing a song called Six Months in a Leaky Boat was um, basically, it, it bombed because nobody would play it. But they were an amazing band, amazing band. Incredible. Massive uh, 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 talent between Tim and Neil. Um, and I think, you know, Neil's talent almost overtook Tim's in the end when after split ends finished and but you know it it, it it um i did enjoy making the two records i made with them and um i mean eddie rayner the keyboard player was an absolute genius as well and um but the you know uh, there was a lot of weird stuff going on on, on in the second album i did with them we did it in or um, I think ended up doing the mixing in in uh, Melbourne at the EMI Studios called Three Hundred One. I think there, the first album we did completely at a studio in in um, Sydney, and it was fantastic living and working in Sydney. And I never forget because the studio was in this suburb, just literally by the very near to the Opera House. It was called Woolamaloo, Woolu Mulu. And um, anyway, it, it was a really happy time. Whereas the second album I did was much um, more difficult. It had some great songs on it. Um, I remember the DX7 had had um, just come out and Neil had written this most amazing song. Oh, I can't remember what it was called now, but it was. I still think it's one of the best songs he's ever written. The worst thing, my, my Neil Finn story, was that he came over to my house the next year or whatever, Split Ends had broken up. I don't think that last record I made was ever released internationally. I think it was only released by Mushroom Records in, in Australia. Straight Old Line, that was the song that Neil wrote that was on that album. Straight, Straight Old Line, if I remember rightly. It's a really good song. Anyway, Neil came to my house with some demos. That was just him on acoustic guitar. 
and I didn't really think much of them and I didn't I don't think I was particularly enthusiastic so I never never worked on the first alarm but I I will um point out that um don't dream it's over was not on that set of demos he played I don't think any of the hits were actually but it kind of it was a shame really because it slightly soured our relationship for 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 whatever reason I can't I don't really know why but I mean it, you know Neil had the most amazing solo career after that with Crowded House. Incredible, yeah. And we all know those Incredible. songs and, and love them. And, and um, you know, it's so weird because I remember when Neil's son was born when we were doing Split Ends, his first son was born. He was now in his 40s or 30, late 30s and <laughs> was playing in Neil's band, you know. <laughs> A bit like Dominic Miller in Sting's band, his son plays in Sting's band as the other guitar player now. Phil Collins' son's playing the drums for Genesis. Yep. It's, yep, it's crazy times. Yeah, and I grew up with all these albums, so I, I think of myself as the kid buying these albums, and <laughs> now, oh, now they've got all their kids playing in the band. So it's absolutely crazy. Um, well, let's... Yeah. let's, uh, let's At least we've still got our hair. Yes, exactly, yes. I've got to ask you, <laughs> just because it's in your resume. Landscape, from the tea rooms of Mars to the hell holes of Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it comes up as 1980. <laughs> what, what, what is that? God knows. I tell you what, the um, the the um, I did these sessions for. I did so many sort of funny odd little sessions. Yep. The drummer. Here we go, Richard Burgess. Right. He was like, he became a producer as well, and I think he moved to LA. Oh, really? Yeah. Richard Burgess, and then the the bass player was a guy called Andy Past. I mean, they they were like kind of synth pop, you know, electronic, but but all like you know major sort of um, you know major chops, all of them. Right. And R Richard was clever. I mean, he probably had an IQ of about. 40,000 or something. He was, <laughs> but yes, I've forgotten about them for sure. God knows what else you've dug up from my past. <laughs> that was the only one that I, 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 you know, that between that and Derek and Clive, of course. Um, yeah. Those, those were the only two sort of, uh, um, you know, outside of the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, things like the work I did with Kate Bush for instance, talking about doing um, the dreaming odd odd sessions, the dreaming. I I was doing sessions with her on the weekend when when I was doing Phil Collins or something. You know, we'd do four days a week, five days a week, rather Monday to Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday. It's like, did I get a day off? No, because Kate Bush asked me to you know to work with her. And of course, you're not going to say no, are you? Um, you know, to that sort of thing. So so. Uh, um, I don't think I had a holiday for about five years all through this period. But, you know, I, you can't complain. I mean, you know, to do a job that you you love so much. I've, I've never said I have a job, really. It's a, it's a hobby, isn't it, that you happen to, to, you know, someone's kind enough to pay you for it. Just don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get the gig with the police, I suppose, is the straightforward question. Uh, oh, actually, you'll love this one. Through XTC, can you believe? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, because XTC toured um, for, you know, quite a few, you know, several tours in like Australia and possibly even America. or And, and so um, one day... Supposedly they're they're on the on the bus talking, and Sting says, "Oh well, 
we've 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 got to get a new producer because um uh for various reasons and um we have to sort of get a new guy basically the 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 guy who did the first three police albums was 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 amazing um can't remember his name now nigel gray he he, he was a doc nigel gray he was a he was a doctor yep but um you know like a p uh, like a gp general yep. practitioner doctor and he made this studio um surrey sound in his sort of spare time and the reason the police went there was because it was cheap and 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 they always miles copeland the manager both police albums I, I i made he never really recognized me as a producer or co-producer or anything <laughs> <laughs> anyway that that miles copeland's a, a, an hour story on its own really but anyway, so they're on the bus, and and Andy Partridge says, "Oh, well, you you ought to try our guy Hugh. He's great." And um, and then Sting said, "Ah, oh, yes, I know Hugh, and I had met Sting at the townhouse back in probably seventy nine. He he was actually signed to Virgin Publishing at the time, and he came in to do a demo." at the studio and that's where I met Sting and I never forget it because we we're doing this demo it was like a day job and um so Sting said to the guy okay you go and do the vocals now so he went into the studio did 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 the vocals or, or started singing and and Sting says no can't you sing it like on your cassette demo and he goes no because that was somebody else well where, where, where Where's the somebody else? Oh no, I fired him because he was a better singer than me. <laughs> he was the drummer, apparently. <laughs> so it's one of those stories that I never forget. And that yep. was the first time I met Sting. And so he knew me only briefly. And so anyway, my manager gets a call from Miles Copeland saying, uh, um, you know, we're going to Montserrat to do an album. Can Hugh come and do it, please? I, I met Stuart once before we went to Montserrat, but otherwise I'd never met Andy before we got to Montserrat. And it was so weird because in those days it was like, okay, you're doing the album. And, and you, know, you know, there was no sort of like meeting to see if we got on or anything like that. It was, you know, in those days it was sort of like that. And in, also in those days, for many years, if you started to do an album... You did the album from start to finish. I mean, especially, you know, the concept of somebody else mixing the recording that I had recorded was really horrible to me. You know, I, I for many, many years, I don't think I ever did an album that I didn't do the whole thing of. And nowadays, you know, you're lucky if you do one song on an album and somebody else has probably mixed that as well or will mix it as well. So it's a whole different thing. So anyway, we just... I turned up in in Montserrat and and off we went, you know, making the record. And it was the Ghost in the Machine record was was reasonably all right to to make in terms of their, you know, social aspects or fighting, or whatever you want to call it. It was it was competitive, but but okay. And um, so that was a whole new experience working. Um, on this Caribbean island that was rather amazing. I don't think I'd been to the Caribbean before that. Again, I'm only like 26 or whatever it is, whatever it was rather. And um, amazing studio, the um, air studios that George Martin put together. Um, I mean, it was technically, it was, you know, really, really good. And um, it was that, that uh, Neve, wasn't that it? it? It was a Neve in there? The famous Neve, yes, that then ended up at, um, uh, where has it ended up now? It's gone to a few places, but um, Brian Adams. I think he only three of those consoles were made, I think. I think it was three. And Brian, one of them ended up at A&M, Studio One at A&M. One ended up at, in Brian's place in Vancouver. The warehouse. I can't remember where the, the other warehouse. ones the warehouse, which I never went to, that was meant to be amazing as well. 
And I don't know where the other one ended up, but um, it was a really fabulous sounding console and it had these remote mic amps. So the mic amps were out in the studio. You know, those consoles were made like battleships mm. and they were, um, you know, incredibly engineered, you know, probably, you know, I don't know if over engineered is the right word, but, but, um, they were still enormous because they had the separate monitoring section. You know, it was sort of before the inline consoles became as popular as they did. But it, it was a great studio, other than the fact that I didn't really like the acoustics in the main studio. They were just not, they were not lively enough for the drums. And so we ended up recording Stuart in the dining room which was adjacent to the studio. And um, so it had a nice live sound, but it was half open to the elements. And at night uh, in Montserrat, um, they have these things called tree frogs and they start making like crickets or, or what, what, what do you call them in America? Those things that make the most horrendous racket. So we couldn't, as soon as nightfall came, we couldn't record drums at all. And also it had no air conditioning, obviously, because it was open. And so it was pretty hot when we were there. And poor old Stuart used to lose his drumsticks. And um, he'd end up literally, I think you can see photographs in some books, um, you know, because Andy was a very prolific photographer as well. And he literally gaffer taped the sticks to his hands. And um, but, but more so on synchronicity than, than Ghost in the Machine from what I can remember but there were a lot of multi-track edits because often we couldn't get through a whole song without you know the the take collapsing and then the other problem which would not be nearly so much of a problem now was the communication so it was very early cctv stuff so we had a camera next to his drum kit and um and then a little screen in, in the control room. So we could see him and talk to him, but he couldn't see us. <laughs> and it's really frustrating if you're drumming and you get to the end of the take or whatever, and there's silence for a minute because Sting's maybe saying something to me or saying what an arsehole Stuart is or something. So I haven't pressed the talk back. And so Stuart would then hey guys I can't hear what you're talking about and and so on and today it would be so easy to have a a, a two-way monitoring thing it would be easy cheap and and so on but in those days it just you know it wasn't like that so that that was frustrating and it became even worse really on the synchronicity album when when people weren't sort of talking to each other but in the other sense it was quite good because Stuart was in his room Sting always played in the control room and Andy was in the studio. So they were in completely in their own uh, geographical locations, I would say. And um, Sting always played in the control room. And he, I don't remember ever in the 20 odd years I've known Sting ever bring a bass amp to, a, I don't even know if he owns a bass amp other than <laughs> when they play live. So... He was always just DI'd. And he'd have some terrible bass, like I think on the on the Ghost in the Machine, he had the carbon fiber Steinberger bass that do you remember it, it yep. sort of had no headstock? Yes, I remember and very it was well. Like really small. And it didn't really it didn't sound that great. It didn't didn't have much bottom <laughs> end to it. And nowadays I wouldn't mind because you'd put you know a Pultec EQ1 or something at 100 hertz. Mm -hmm. It would just make the thing sound wonderful. But I don't think we had any pull techs at, at, at air then. I mean, they had a fair amount of gear, but not a huge amount of outboard gear. Plus, don't forget in those days, it was still very uh, um, digital stuff was only just coming out. I mean, there might have been an AMS delay or something like that. But apart from that, you know, you had you know, which I, which I still love now. I really don't like being in a studio without an EMT echo plate, for instance, you know. And um, so anyway, 
Uh, and then the other thing I can really remember about Ghost in the Machine is, is um, Sting was always very keen on his fitness and, you know, he's an extremely vain man, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. And um, so in those days, he had this thing where you could hang upside down, you know, you'd get into these boots and then swing around so you hang upside down. And then he had this thing, it was like a jogging mat, which is like a very small trampoline with very tight springs on it. And you'd, you'd tie weights around your feet so you could sort of like emulate jogging. But of course, he wanted to play the bass while he was bouncing up and down <laughs> on this mat in the control room playing the bass. And I think you, you can probably remember or imagine the police playing where Sting would be pogoing around the stage. So it was a bit yep. like that but in the control room. But the problem was, first of all, the control room had a sprung floor. So literally, he's bouncing up and down. You can see the tape recorder going like this as well. <laughs> the whole room is basically going like this. And you go, Sting, can you please not, you know, bounce? So or can you just not use the trampoline when we're doing a take and he'd just say no fuck off you know <laughs> and so you just have to put up with it and then his bass playing would would be um sometimes sloppy would be you know a nice way to describe it and one of the great things about the police is <coughs> Stuart's um you know they're not like drum machine or computer what we, what I always call arsehole tight. You know what I mean? There was something about the band that made the band how it was. You know, Stuart would, would by nature tend to speed up a bit in choruses or, or whatever. And, and so anyway, you'd end up with a take. That's a great take, but the bass was could be all over the places. And then like, okay, can you can you punch in those beginning of chorus two? No. So it's like oh. <laughs> And no, no, it's great as it is. It's great as it is. So luckily, every each of the three guys could play their master's instruments. So Danny was Sting's roadie. And so sometimes at the end of the day, when Sting had gone home, Danny would come in and I'd punch in, the, you know, because the bass and bass drum would be about half a second apart, you know, when they should be sort of relatively together. So I'd get, Danny would, punch the occasional um uh he'd punch the occasional bass in in fact also i don't know if it's it's if it's um known or not but on um demolition man on the um ghost in the machine track da danny plays the bass the whole way through that track but i don't think sting would ever have let it go on the cover right danny's the bass is player. he gonna let it be in the interview <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and then th 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 things like la <laughs> later on, I think it was during the Synchronicity tour, Sting and Stuart had a massive fight. It was at a gig in France. They had a huge fight like the, the, on the afternoon, probably, you know, something to do with the sound check or whatever. And um, Stuart punched, uh, Sting punched Stuart and cracked a rib. And he literally, he, he couldn't, he, you know, he couldn't do anything, let, let alone play the drums. So it was like, well, we can't cancel the gig. There's like God knows how many thousands of people already coming in. So, so uh, Stuart's roadie was a guy called Jeff. And he, he literally played the whole gig, put like a cap on. They made sure they didn't put any follow spots on. He played the whole gig. <laughs> no one ever knew. Wow, I suppose he'd been with him for years watching him play. He would hopefully would know how yeah. to play. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah. So um yeah, I mean there's loads of police stories like that. So, given all the sort of uh you know, the the tabloid stories of of of, you know, the tensions in making the record, um what was your experience, you know, from the production? side of it yeah where do we start <laughs> um yeah Let, let's say it was difficult um 
to, to, to say the least, really. The whole experience of making that record was was really difficult from from start to finish and um i had worked with the band on ghost in the machine which was like i guess two years before i don't think it was more than two years matty had only been 18 months and the thing is that record was relatively easy to make can can compared to synchronicity but I think it's you know it's well known that the that the band sort of had um egos you know and 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 like with any band that's become successful and they're also stuck together just three guys in the band stuck together touring relentless schedules there's bound to be sort of personality problems and 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 so on it didn't. They didn't really vent themselves very much on on Ghost in the Machine, but it, I was immediately aware of 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 the tension had upped uh, from sort of maybe six or seven to eight or nine out of ten when we um, met again uh, on um, Montserrat to do to do Synchronicity. Now you've got to remember that I hadn't um, seen the band. I might have gone and seen a show or a couple of shows or something but i hadn't really sort of seen the band so uh, uh for all that time so we get back together and i'm all sort of excited and um sting turned up at the studio with the majority of the songs obviously uh, uh, of which the band hadn't heard at all and so we are set the gear up in the studio and 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 so on and so forth and start trying to play the songs and no, nothing's working at all nothing's working and there's various arguments and and you know Stuart doesn't want to do what Sting wants him to do and like if 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 it is still a sticking point now in every breath you take the sting quite rightly wanted the the drum beat to be very simple and stuart w w w always wants his his um drums to be impressive because he's an, a, an amazing drummer and even 10 or 12 years later when they were being inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and turned up in Michigan or wherever it was that it's held and they, and they had to play some songs. There was arguments all these years later about how Stuart didn't want to play Every Breath You Take, their most famous song ever, because it didn't show his drums off enough. So you can see what the whole sort of um, vibe was all, all the time. And, and, and Sting and Stuart would sort of bait each other up. And so anyway, after about over a week i think of being there we literally had nothing on on the tape at all that you could say was a take you know it just wasn't wasn't going anywhere so miles copeland stuart's brother the manager was called and he came over to montserrat and i really really remember this so clearly having a meeting Outside of the studio control room, there was a swimming pool. And I remember us, basically the band, Stuart Copeland and myself, having a meeting on the terrace by the swimming pool. And the, end, the, the, the meeting ended up with one question, which was, are we going to mm. just quit as a band right now? And there never will be a fifth police record or are we going to try and make an effort to get on together and make an album because we've got some great songs here and thank god the answer was okay we'll we'll carry on doing it but it was definitely always going to be the last album and the whole process of making the album was was difficult really difficult if we were eating lunch or dinner together it was perfectly 
all right. You know, if you were chatting about the weather or, or photography or something like that, chess, you know, it was all right. But as soon as three of them get in the studio and start talking or playing music, it just went, it went crazy. If I tried to break up an argument uh, and say, come on, guys, let's, let's, you know, sort this out and get on with it, I would just be brushed aside and they'd say, oh, shut up, Hugh, you don't know anything about us at all. You, you know, we've only known you for a few weeks. Don't start trying to tell us what to do, you know. <laughs> and so it was like, ah. I, I mean, I have to say, I, I, you know, it got to the stage where going home every night was a relief, you know, and um, just to get out of the studio. And, um, but anyway, going to a slightly more positive thing, I think the, the, the strain and, and stress of the, uh, uh, um, the band sort of fighting, for want of a better word, did give the album an edge which which i think really d does you know make it in in a way i mean particularly the songs um synchronicity 1 and synchronicity 2 which have a real i mean i don't think you'll ever hear a drum track better than stuart playing on synchronicity 1 i mean it's incredible and i think he was probably so angry when he was playing that song. And he also, you know, we had this big problem, which I think I described in a, in our, earlier in our interview, where he was playing in a, in, a, in a room completely separated from the rest of us. In fact, all three guys were in different rooms. Sting was in the control room with me. Stuart was playing drums in the dining room and Andy was in, in, in the guitar, in the, uh, playing his guitar in the actual studio, studio area. And Stuart kind of hated it because it was very difficult to communicate, but he, you know, he realized that, that the best, that was better for the sound. And so when he was playing, he was, he was angry, I think. And, 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 um, that fueled it. Of, uh, <laughs> kind of fueled it but made it great and, and do you know what most songs particularly those those songs like synchronicity one synchronicity two the 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 big sort of rocking songs we had to edit because the um sticks would go flying out of his hands because of it was hot and sweaty because we weren't in a control in, in a studio room with air conditioning and stuff so it was, um, I remember quite a lot of razor blade slicing to get the best backing track tape, take rather, together. Also, he knew that he was under pressure to, um, particularly with the, with the rock songs, to the, the, the backing track was, was what the rest of the song hung on, you know, and we all know as, as producers and stuff that the, that the 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 rhythm section of 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 a band is is what is like the spinal cord of a human being everything it's the most important part and everything else hangs off it and if that spinal cord isn't particularly you know good and tight and 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 together and grooving and rocking then 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 you know the song never will be sort of thing it's it's why all those amazing soul songs and whatever your favorite old soul or, or Motown song sounds so great because the rhythm section was just so great and there was no overdubbing or tracking or probably much editing on those songs then either. But um, anyway, so I think Stuart felt a, a, a pressure to get his thing done and he was also, I, I mean, I did say that we had problem getting the songs together in the first place, but once we had got an arrangement, then what he's playing, what you hear on most of that record is within one or two takes of 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 us deciding, okay, that's the way the song's going to go. Because, I mean, songs like Every Breath You Take, we tried recording it in, in lots of different ways as well. Sting had a very basic demo where that 
uh, the riff that Andy plays on the guitar, Sting had played on a, like an organ sound. So it was Andy who came up with that guitar, who translated it into that guitar riff and, and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's amazing. I mean, listening back to it now, um, I think some of the songs, to be honest, everybody says it's such a great album all the way through, but I, 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 don't, I don't think um, Oh My God is such a great song. It's just basically a riff, you know, with saxes on it. Nothing, you know, it's just a riff that goes from beginning to end, isn't it? And Stuart's song is okay, but not great. I mean, for me, it's like I love Synchronicity 1 and 2. I think Walking in Your Footsteps is, is, is a good thing. And that was like, we had this new um, Oberheim equipment, which was a Oberheim synthesizer, an Oberheim, it was called an OB-8, and I think. And then we had a sequencer that was called a DSX and a drum machine that was called a DMX, and they were all Oberheim, and they had blue stripes on them, I remember that, and worn-up ends to them, and you could MIDI them together, and it was quite early days of that sort of thing, so that um, walking in your footsteps was all done with this Oberheim stuff, um, uh, programming up that, and then you get to side two, which to me is the uh, um, amazing side. And I think it was also a great thing to say, okay, well, let's put more of the up-tempo stuff on side one and then all the other stuff on, on side two. I think that works really well. So obviously you've got Every Breath You Take and then King of Pain, which I think is an amazing song, Wrapped Around Your Finger, is I think one of my favorite songs ever as well not just police song i think that's amazing and then you've got tea in the sahara which is a great way to finish an album and then i'd forgotten that murder by numbers was actually not on the original disc because we we kind of ran out of space and um so murder by numbers was um put on the CD and the cassette as an extra song. And that was recorded very late in the, I don't know if you know the story about know. Murder by Numbers. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people love that song. And we used to get, well, we, I, I even as producer used to get letters from people saying this is the most immoral and, and disgusting thing that you should ever do, talking about murdering people like this and, and, um, you know, really sort of quite a lot of hate mail about how irresponsible it was to, to have a record like this. But it actually, quite a funny story, because one day we were having either, last, I think it was an evening meal, and uh, uh, Andy Summers was fiddling around with his guitar, playing like some jazz chords, and... Sting said, oh, that sounds good. And he said, oh, let's, let's hear a bit more of that. And then he got out his notebook. because so he had this notebook that he would scribble lyrics into. And he had all these lyrics actually pre-written down. But had, I don't know, we hadn't sort of thought of, or he hadn't. I don't think I'd ever seen those lyrics before. But anyway, he bought them out. And he goes, oh, I think these lyrics would go like that. Let's make it into a song. And so they fiddled around for a bit, half an hour or something, and then Stuart was there. And then, I kid you not, they went, Sting went into the control room with me, Andy went into the studio, and Stuart went into the uh, um, dining room to play the, the drums. And what you hear on that record is the run-through. That is take one. They'd never played it before. And they never played it again. And that, and that literally, that run through Stuart is completely ad libbing, you know, through the whole thing. That's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. Amazing, isn't it? I'm going to yeah. go back and listen to it. Yeah. I, it's it. 
you, you may be really excited to go back and listen to it. I, lo- I love the insight. Um, I know Sting over the years said it was more about politics than it was about it was about the manipulation of people and uh, um, and that was just like a that that was his his way of spinning the story. But yeah, the the lyrics are definitely dark. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, all all the best songs. I mean, still nobody really knows what mm. every breath you take is about. You know, is it a stalker? Is it this, that, and the other? Same as in the air tonight by Phil Collins. Nobody, and Phil even says, "Well, I don't know what the <laughs> lyrics are about either." And um, I don't. I mean, I've, I've I've never had a conversation with Sting exactly about it. But I think, in a way, that's what makes great records. Great records, isn't it? Because you can interpret them however you want but um yeah the beauty is in the eye of the beholder i I feel like with every breath you take i mean when it came out i think most of us felt like it was a love song you know it was just like you know when you're so in love that you know every breath you take it but of course you know as time went on people started to say oh it's kind of creepy i suppose it is if you're not actually in a relationship with somebody it's creepy but if you're in a relationship with somebody it's a love song it's all relative (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. So we 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 ended up finishing the recording, and we had uh, Christmas off. We went to another island next door to Montserrat called Nevis, and so we all stayed in a hotel and had Christmas there. And again, that's fine when when we weren't in the studio, you know, making music, and. Um, and then we reconvened in Canada in this studio called Le Studio, which doesn't exist anymore, like most studios in the world. But it was a great studio with an SSL board and um, nice recording room. Uh, the only problem with it is it was in the middle of nowhere, just outside a village uh, um, in a ski resort. And um, which actually wasn't bad because Stuart and Sting both skied so they could, you know, go off skiing. But we spent a while there overdubbing, trying to get some of the songs together. Like we weren't happy with Every Breath You Take. It wasn't finished. It was spent several afternoons fiddling around with the middle section and the, one of the things I would blow my trumpet for, it was my idea to have this piano thing going through that hole of the middle section, which gives the real sort of tension to it. Because um, uh, don't forget, nobody in, in the police was really a great keyboard player. And, um, you know, it was usually sort of fairly basic stuff and um, so that came together gradually and then we were overdubbing other bits and pieces and there would be various problems like one I can remember really well which is um, the fact that Sting and Stuart didn't really like being in the same room together at the studio so (laughs) very often Sting would go off skiing in the morning and Stuart would come into the studio and there might be a tambourine overdub that we'd suggested or, or, or something like that. So one day, Sting's out skiing, Stuart comes in, he says, I've got this great idea, I want to put this hi-hat part on every breath you take. So being the eternal diplomat that I am, I say, okay, um, let's, let's do it, see what it's like. So he goes in the studio and he records this hi-hat part, which at the time I didn't think was why we needed it or what it was, but it was one of what I call his sort of like sewing machine hi-hat things. You know, he does these really intricate, um, especially on some of the earlier police records, very intricate hi-hat parts, which a lot of people don't know, but some of the intricacy was brought about by him uh, plugging the hi hat through a delay line, so he had this little Korg delay. So some of that stuff that sounded unbelievably difficult and tricky was actually made by delays and things. Uh, so anyway, we recorded this hi hat part. Everything's fine. Have lunch, and then um, 
Stuart goes out skiing in the afternoon. Sting comes in the hut in 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 the studio. And he says, "All right, what did you do this morning?" So I said, "Well, we we tried a hi hat part on Every Breath You Take. Let me hear it." So play the um, track down. He says, "I hate it. I hate it. I think it's terrible. I, I really think it's it's terrible. Um, I don't want to hear it again. Get rid of it." So I said, "Well, don't you think we should sort of just..." see what Stuart says. No, no, I want you to get rid of it right now. And um, so I said, well, okay, all right. And, and, and so I go over to the machine and uh, put the track into ready and he stands <laughs> by the machine with me and he says, I want to see that red light come on on that track. So I raised it and uh, so the next time Stuart's in the studio and that song comes up, and we're listening to it for whatever reason, where's my hi hat gone? What do, you, what do you mean? Oh, 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 gosh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, sorry, Sting um, didn't like it, and then he says, yeah, I hated your effing hi hat part. And it's not there anymore. And of course, nowadays on Pro Tools, you find you just take it off the playlist or whatever. And it, you know, it, it it would still be there. And of course, in those days, once 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 something went, it went as we used to say to the great magnet in the sky, and it was gone forever. And so Stuart was so angry with me, and but by that time, the tension and everything going on with the record, I don't mind admitting that that I. I can't. I wouldn't say I was siding with Sting, but I, I was. You know, these hit songs were written by him, and they were becoming. Um, you know, I didn't want to trash them. I think we had recorded extremely good stuff on them, and so. I couldn't stay loyal to everybody. Otherwise, it just, you know, it, it wouldn't have worked. So. Literally, after that point, I don't think Stuart was happy or wanted to talk to me at all. And that was an uncomfortable feeling because Stuart's a lovely guy. And we've obviously met and made up since. But it was it was it was really difficult, you know. But in order to make, you know, we just would have gone round in circles otherwise. Particularly those three songs, Every Breath You Take, King of Plain and Wrapped Around Your Finger, were totally and utterly rearranged in the studio when we were mixing oh, them. Wow. Those three songs, particularly King of Pain, had everything going through the song all the way. And we sat down when we were mixing it and we said, this is rubbish, it's just boring. When I say everything was going through everything, it was like the drums were, were everywhere. And we spent one afternoon, I remember it really, really clearly, just Sting and me in the control room. And thank God for SSL automation and noise gates and things because the, there's like snare drums that come in to start with where there's nothing else there. That was like a whole drum kit playing. So I had to noise gate everything else out so you didn't hear it. And if, if, you, if you listen really, really carefully, you can hear and it's probably only me that really knows because I know that certain things come in a bit like weirdly and we're using like unmuting mutes on the, on the SSL. And so that song was completely rearranged in the mix to be what it is. And to a certain extent, wrapped around your finger was like that as well. And I think we redid the bass on it uh, overdub later, which is basically all that um, electric double bass thing that um, Val Salinger or something. It was it was an a, a electric double bass. So that's all uh, double bass going through a Roland um, chorus pedal, the little um, blue chorus pedal. And then um, a bit of uh, uh, a four-string electric bass dubbed on top of oh, that, which was this rather horrible thing I didn't like. It was called a mm. Steinberger, I think. It had no machine heads. It was like this 
I mean, it looked cool because it was this one piece of like carbon fiber or something, but it, they, it never had much bottom end to it. I didn't really like like them to record with very much. They look good, but that was a massive breakthrough, getting those songs to sound like the way they did. I remember thinking this is the, the, the best thing I've ever done in terms of making a console work to the song. Right. Did you mix on an SSL again? You were on, on the SSL. Yes, it was all mixed on the SSL at, at, at that studio system. And, but it was I mean. tracked. Am I right on uh, 8078? Because I always think I always remember the videos of them jumping up yeah, and down yeah, on was... Neve. <laughs> yeah, no, all all the tracking was on that famous Neve desk in in Montserrat that had the. Um, 8078, but it was designated, I wrote this down as well, a 4792, because only three were made like that, uh, custom designed for Air Studios. The, the day we finished mixing Synchronicity was the, um, one of the best days of my life, and probably the <laughs> band as well, in the sense that we all felt a massive, massive sense of relief but also very proud. I knew that we had a hit, which is not often you say that with every breath you take. I, I knew it was meant to be a hit, uh, um, and so did everybody who heard it right from the demo stage. So I had confidence in that, but um, it was just so, so much weight off everybody's back to get out of that studio and away from each other, I have to say. And um, thank God it turned out to be um, such a great swan song and, and was so successful because it would have been awful to have ended on a damp squib. And so, you know, thanks to the band and thanks to everybody who worked on, on the record. And it was just uh, a great experience. But at the time, there were periods where, you know, you literally wanted to go home and give the job to someone else, I have to say, but. Do you have like desert island pieces of equipment, things that if in an ideal world, that if you had at your fingertips to make an album, you know are gonna do the job? My favorite desert island mm -hmm. pieces of gear are a Neumann U87 Wonderful. microphone, a Shaw, SM57 microphone. And I think I could record any album. If I had plenty of each of those mics, I could do a perfectly good job at recording anything on any album purely using those Amazing. two mics. So th those, I mean, obviously I love other mics and stuff, but I could make a decent album with those two mics, full stop. Then, I could not do without um, a Universal Audio Yuri 1176 compressor limiter. Uh, absolutely, I, I would be completely lost if I didn't have one of those. I think they're the best. I mean, there's obviously fantastic other limiters, but all round wise, that is definitely, so I can only have one of those. Two mics is okay, one of those, and then, I want um, a EMT 140 echo plate, mm. please, because um, that is, um, I, I, I know you can get good facsimiles and much more reverbs out of, out of a, um, a, a, you know, digital plugins or whatever now, but I think a, a, a really good sounding 140 with with tube amps in it and stuff is just amazing. And then I don't know, it's either between um, a, 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 a good Neve preamp probably, having a good microphone amplifier I think is really important. So I would choose probably a, a 1081 four band. I mean, I used to have um, several of them. And so I think that is really, really necessary. So that is one, two, three, four. That's five bits of gear. So 
So if I was allowed a second compressor, I would have a DBX160 because I think they are the most fantastic limiters. But if I was only allowed one, I would still go for the 1176. But the DBX160 is amazing. And then, you know, the, the toss-up is really, if you had another piece of gear, you know, does it have to be a, a, a loud speaker? Well, it does and it doesn't, because I think you can get used to speakers as long as you can sort of A, B them. But I did spend a lot of the early 80s of those records we're talking about working on these acoustic research AR-18s, which were cheap as chips. My sort of or English version of, of NS-10s, I suppose, I did a lot of records on them. Most of every breath you take would have been recorded, overdubbed, and mixed on them, just occasionally going to the big monitors, which very often in studios didn't sound very good in those days. We didn't have KRKs and things, which I quite like now. So, you know, I, I would probably have to put that as the last piece of gear that I would really like to have. So, of course, there's millions of other, millions of other, I love, gadgets and gear and stuff, but those would be my Desert Island ones. Another bit of gear that we used to use a lot was the Roland JC120 Jazz Chorus Use amp, which I used a lot with the police as well, actually. And we used to mic the, the, the you know, it had this chorus sound on it. So one speaker was chorused. It had two 12-inch speakers. One was chorused and the other wasn't was straight so we used to mic them both again very close and that would give you this sort of stereo spread and for instance in um, Family Snapshot that song there's um, the Yamaha CP70 piano I think it was called mm -hmm. you know it was like a real piano but had uh, you know was electric and that the sound of that is is um, the CP70 going through a jazz chorus amp beautiful I mean, I think the purists absolutely hated the JC120 because it was transistor mm -hmm. amp, and, and so you couldn't get any any decent, you know, guitar distortion out of it. But we we never used it in for distortion. We always used it for clean sounds and love love the chorus. And the same with, you know, Peter's vocal. Um, all over that Melt album, he's going through um, either a Eventide harmonizer or um, or, or I don't know if we used the AMS one, which had um, recently come out then as well. And um, same with Phil Collins, always had some sort of harmonizing effect on the on the vocal. The H three thousand. Anyway, I don't mean to die. No, no, no. That's great. The H three thousand. Yeah, I, I I still to this day use the the H three thousand. I love the sort of vocal thickening trick of just detuning it underneath and putting it up. It's it's yeah. wonderful, and it's st you know even though it's digital, it it has a certain randomness because every time you do it and put it through, it comes out differently. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It was sort of early days of all that stuff, but I I didn't realize till the other day there was digital recorders around in in seventy nine and eighty. They just started to come out, and um, it, it was the new news. But I think. They were very expensive, and um, so to hire them in, as it would have been those days, would have been probably very expensive. And also, um, I, I don't remember yearning to, 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 to use digital, really, until particularly until 48-track Sony Digitals came out, and you think, and we thought, oh, well... Now I don't have to sync two 24 tracks up anymore because that had become the, the norm. But I did do an album in 1982 with um, Phil Collins and I both produced this album for Frida, the redheaded girl from ABBA. Um, Polar Studios in Stockholm, which they owned, was a great studio. And they had um, a very early, I think it was a 3M 24 track digital and we did 
her whole album on that. And I remember struggling with it the whole time, sound wise. I don't think it sounded great. If you were overdubbing, there was a latency. Mm. Um, so it was really difficult if, if a musician was trying to, you know, listen on line in because he, he, the, there was something like 10 or 15 milliseconds or something, you know, which is a, a, a lot if, if it sounds like nothing, but it's a lot to, and it was, it was just a bit of a nightmare. But anyway, I'm digressing again. That's quite all right. It took me a long time. It, it took me a long time to, to get into digital and even then, I would be changing work methods to 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 compensate for the digitalness. A and M Studios or Henson or whatever it's called now. That 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 was my second home in LA for a long time. Yeah, wonderful studio. Yeah, I always stayed at the Mondrian before it became popular, and every day I would drive along from the hotel along Fountain Avenue to La Brea, mm. in the lot, yep. work, yep. drive all the way back. Yeah. Is, is, the, Mon LA. is so the Mondrian even there anymore? Or did they change the name? No, well, I don't know. It was, the, it, was, it was the one, you know, named oh, after well. the artist Mondrian with all, with all the colors. Yeah, I remember. It yeah. was next door. Yeah, I, remember, yeah. I don't know if that's even there now. The House of Blues, was next door to it on sunset, you know. It was it was just literally about two or three hundred yards the other side of Chateau Marmont. But I, I hear the other day that that's closed now. Oh, it has. I think I, it's still. I think it's still the Mondrian's still there, but for some reason, oh, I, I, yeah, because they've totally redesigned the look of it. It used to be all white, and then you had the Mondrian uh, paintings on the outside. Um, I'm looking yeah. at it here, and it's it's just a gray, it's just a gray looking building now. So, yeah, it, it became super trendy in in the two thousands, and mm. and like everything, just gray or beige became the sort of the deal. Yeah, it looks like it was bought by Sam Nazarian, it's part of the SBE Entertainment Group. Now, that's that's okay. in two thousand two. Yeah, so. It's a, it's a what a shame. It was always like, but it's interesting that it hasn't disappeared. It's just changed the way it's looked. So I'd, I'd forgotten it even exists because it was such a yeah. fixture when you're driving down Sunset Boulevard to see this beautiful building with the yeah. Mondrian. Yeah. But the real rock and roll hang was the Sunset Marquee, wasn't it? Probably of still course. is, is it? Yeah, when I was I was working with Aerosmith in 2011 and they were all staying at the Sunset Marquee. Yeah, even yeah. even now bands yeah do that. Yeah, Phil always used to stay at the Sunset Marquee, but, but in one of the I think they call it a cottage in the yes. garden. Yeah, that's that's where Stephen stays, and they're like little they're like little apartments. They've got their own little apartments and everything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. There was a studio there at one point as well. It might still be there, or at least it might have been still been there just a handful of years ago. Because I remember um, people recording. Yeah. That. Yeah, yeah, I never did, but yeah, I've had some fun times there. I, I remember when we were we'd finished some roughs on the record, and Stephen had this Hennessy sports car, um, and we, but it only had one big speaker like this in the middle, so it just played mono. It was pretty bad, and <laughs> he were, we were sitting in the parking lot in the car park for the for the Sunset Marquee. And he's like, oh, my friends, Jim, and I can't remember the other person are, are going to pop by in a second. You know, my friends, and you know when rock stars use people by first names, you don't know who's going to turn up. So up pulls this Porsche, and of course out gets Jim Carrey. So uh, you, you, you know yeah. what I'm talking about, those kind of experiences <laughs> yes. where you, they're all just like first name basis, but to us it's like, wow, that's Jim Carrey. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had some great times working at A&M over the years, you know, meeting people and hanging out with people on the lot. It always seems so much more glamorous, Anyways. doesn't it? In, when you're in LA, yeah. every, everything seems more glamorous. <laughs> I know, it does, doesn't it? I remember meeting Barry White on the, on the lot. Wow. He was just the same wow. as, as, yeah. No, it was great. And I remember meeting um, Joni Mitchell as well. Oh. 
and she um she came in and was you know listening to to some of our stuff and we were just hanging out at, outside uh in the lot afterwards and i always remember her saying she f she always thought that any artist had a a a, a maximum of 10 years where they made their best music always had a, like a 10 year window kind of thought about it and she she's probably right actually i mean you know the beatles didn't even last 10 years did they yeah when you think that, about yeah. it no you you're right but I, when i but then i wonder i don't disagree with the premise but i wonder when you look at guys like the Genesis guys, because they, they all had two lives because they're a band, what, in 68, 69. And then, you know, Peter goes solo and then, you know, he's still, at, he's absolutely massive through till like at least, you know, early 90s. So he had a good 20 plus years of being at the top of the game, but, it, but he had a, two life spans. And the same with Phil, they had two lives because they had a band and then they had a solo career. Yeah, yeah. They are a bit freakish. I mean, the Stones, you could say the same thing too. But I, I think the Stones, only only my favourite period of the Stones is really from, say, 64 to 73. I don't, you know, the odd, the odd song they've come out with since 73 might be good, but that, that whole period through the late 60s, I mean... Uh, 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 um, Beggar's Banquet and Let It Bleed are two of my favourite all-time records. Yep, yep. For sure. Both masterpieces. Thanks, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget, if you haven't already, check out the other two parts in the three-part series. Thank you ever so much for watching. Have a marvellous time. See you all again soon. So long, farewell, adios, auf Wiedersehen, au revoir, tschüss, goodbye, farewell.